Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Morrison. I'm the Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I direct our global health policy work there. And I'm delighted to join with my close colleague, Sarah Ladislau, Senior Vice President for Energy Security and Climate Change Program here at CSIS in hosting today's guest, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah, uh, President and, uh, and CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation. He's been in that role since March of 2017. Uh, we got to know him very well in his, some of his prior work, uh, including the six year stint as USAID Administrator, that's the US Agency for International Development. He had a short stint at USDA as the Under Secretary for Research, uh, Education and Economics. And we got to know him initially in his role when he arrived at, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in 2001. He was there for eight years. And in that period really pioneered some of the early finance innovation work as well as getting the development program up and running. And so uh, Raj, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, thanks for having me. So I wanna offer quick special thanks uh, on the Rockefeller Foundation staff side uh, great thanks to Ashley Chang, John, Jonathan Quick, who will be doing a podcast with us tomorrow on this same subject in which we will post under the coronavirus crisis updates on Monday. John Spangler, John Gans, and others. On our staff, Amit Mandavili, John Mons, who's producing this, Anna Carroll. Uh, this is going to be an a interactive, a lively conversation. Those of you in the audience wish to submit questions, please do that, and we'll weave them into the course of the conversation. I want to first turn to, to, to Raj and ask you a question. What do you make of our elections? What's your thinking right now? Where are we? And what does this foretell as you think about this world that we're in today uh, and trying to shape the outcomes of the recovery? What does this say to you? Uh, well, thank you, Steve. And, and thank you, Sarah. And you're starting with the tough one. <laughs> I, I Look, this is a uh, an extremely close election. I think at the end of the day, uh, I got I cut my teeth in politics working for Al Gore in 2000 and uh, had the opportunity to be part of the, the recount in Florida. And I have only felt like every election is a close election, you know, and our country has been uh, divided politically for a very long time. It seems like those divisions are uh, perhaps more stark and more energetic today than they have been in a long time. And that's unfortunate because the challenges we face require coming together, you know, wearing a mask to protect yourself and protect uh, your neighbor is, is all about uh, doing something that's best for everybody and uh, fixing our economy to have more equity and opportunity for people that feel left out and left behind, whether they are, voting for Donald Trump or voting for Joe Biden. And it's the same feeling of watching others uh, seem to do quite well and being unable to feed your kids and unable to be secure that if you get ill, if you get COVID, you can afford a test, you can afford treatment, and, and you can be confident that your workplace will take you back uh, You know, if you have to take a leave. And the reality is too many Americans don't, do not feel and have not for some time felt secure in those basic elements of human security and, and opportunity. And so uh, this is going to be a close election. I'm glad that so far, it seems like everybody is counting the votes, counting every vote in a peaceful and deliberate way. Uh, you've, CSIS is not a new institution to uh, the way elections play out all over the world. And at USAID, we would counsel our counterparts in every part of the planet. Take your time, get it right, have a process, follow it, stay calm, stay collected, and watch and observe. And that's what's happening right now in America. It's appropriate. I'm confident we'll get to an answer, and I'm confident we'll implement that answer without a lot of noise and strife. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations on the launch last week, October 26th, of the Rockefeller Foundation's ambitious commitment of $1 billion over the next three years to catalyze a more inclusive, equitable green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The foundation shared with us a short video we want to prompt right now. We'll take a peek at that, and then we'll we come back and we'll begin the discussion. John Mons, if you could...
In the face of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic, there is no going back. But we can make a choice on which future we want. COVID-19 has devastated families and communities, and the world's most vulnerable people have been paying the highest price. Low and middle income people have lost their jobs, homes, and lives at a rate double or triple other groups. The pandemic turned back the clock on 25 years of progress on gender equality, education, poverty reduction, and hunger. Meanwhile, the climate crisis looms. These two disasters will push hundreds of millions of people back into poverty. Which brings us back here. Do we choose a new normal? Or do we reimagine a future that's equitable and sustainable for all? A future where the latest technology and science advancements are deployed to empower people around the world. A future where not only do we overcome COVID-19, but we have the tools and data to protect us from the next pandemic. A future that brings a billion people out of energy poverty without triggering a climate disaster, allowing them to unleash their full potential. A future that promises individual opportunity for all. The time to act is now. That's exactly what we're going to do. For 107 years, the Rockefeller Foundation has worked to elevate humankind through science, data, and innovation. Our mission is especially critical today. To combat these dual crises, we're going to go big. We will continue our work to disrupt inequity here and around the world, investing in economic opportunity and access to nutritious, affordable food. There's no recovery while the most vulnerable continue to die from COVID-19. So we will scale up our work to empower communities with science-based tests, tools, and data to fight the coronavirus and prevent future outbreaks. There's no equitable, sustainable future while a billion people are sitting in the dark. So we will invest and encourage investment in distributed renewable energy to connect those people to a modern global economy. Together with investors, private sector, and international organizations, we will catalyze billions of dollars in investments in green energy technology. It's possible to end energy poverty in 10 years. It's possible not only to prevent the next pandemic, but to improve healthcare for all. It's possible to provide living wages to those who work hard. It's possible to prevent 60% of chronic disease by providing affordable, healthy food. It's possible to reimagine the future. To meet this moment, we're choosing to act. What will you choose? Thank you. Thank you. So we, this initiative that we're going to talk about today, it's got a dual focus. We'll hear from Raj about it, catalyzing millions of dollars in private concessional investments to scale distributed renewable energy across developing countries in a second dimension of more ins ensuring more equitable access to COVID-19 tests and vaccines, science-based tools, better analytics, and strengthening public health systems. And this has been described in, in very ambitious terms as a call to invest big in a reimagined future, seize the moment now in the midst of this pandemic to address the glaring disparities that it's revealed. And as we're told, it's the biggest commitment by Rockefeller in its history. So Rod, you're really sort of staking your reputation here. This is gonna be a signature moment for you. You're harking back to the historical legacies of the foundation in many of the transformations in medicine, but also in our own social society here in the United, in our own society here in America over the last uh, dec uh, last century. And we'll talk more about the foundation's efforts in the spring in launching the US national COVID-19 testing and tracing action plan. I know this is building right off of that. So let me ask you to start on the initiative. Why this initiative now, at this moment in time, and why are you combining these two elements? of energy poverty, access to energy, and, and the health essentials, ending inequities with regard to testing vaccines and data. How do they reinforce one another 
versus compete against one another. So give us the big picture on the rationale, why jumping in now in such a bold way and how do these two sectors interact with one another? Well, you know, th this is an extraordinary moment in our collective history. Uh, we're living through, call it what you want, the global financial crisis, the Great Depression, World War II, all combined from an economic perspective. And the consequence of it is devastating. We know that in America, just last week, there were 23 million, north of 23 million unemployment claims filed and executed. We know that around the world, the World Bank estimates that 500 million people, 425 million up to 580 million is their range, will be pushed back into uh, an expanded definition of poverty uh, as a result of this. The Gates Foundation published the Goalkeepers Report that showed right. that we are gonna lose, we have lost two and a half decades of progress in six months of the COVID crisis on the very essential task of saving the lives of women and children and ensuring that all people everywhere can expect that their children live to five and beyond and their mothers give childbirth and survive it and, uh, and their basic levels of health are attained in every community on the planet. So you ask yourself, well, okay, this is a huge setback to uh, the sustainable development goals. It's a huge setback to the aspiration for true access to opportunity and equity in the United States. Three, three to five times, you know, Black Americans are three to five times more likely to be hospitalized. One in 1,000 African Americans have died of COVID. It is just an extraordinary moment in our history. And when you look at extraordinary moments in our history, uh, we are at a choice point. Either we can say we're going to recover from this crisis in a way that protects those who are vulnerable and in a way that lifts up those uh, who otherwise would be left behind. And then five, 10, 15 years later, we'll have a, a more equitable society, like the GI Bill, for example, did that in America after World War II, although only in targeted communities. And, uh, or you look at the alternative. You know, The alternative is we do more of what we're doing, which is preferentially focus the public health response on those American communities that have resources and access to a $4 trillion healthcare system preferentially focus our international efforts on G7 and G20 industrialized countries and exclude those that are left behind. And the, the choice, if we make the wrong choice, we will simply leave billions of people behind as we, as we shape a global recovery. So we felt that this was a moment when an institution that has spent 107 years fighting for uh, science and innovation to transform the nature of, of equity and fairness in the world, uh, that this was our moment to go big. And, and we issued a, a bond and raised uh, nearly between the bond and some other activities, raised a billion dollars to commit now to a equitable, uh, sustainable recovery. And in that context, we think the two most important things we can do, others can do lots of other things, but the things we can do are accelerate the public health response right now for those who are vulnerable. And I'm happy to get into that and par partner with others to drive a global green recovery. And in our case, uh, the work we've done over the last decade, I think is very uniquely well suited to make sure that such a global green recovery lifts a billion people out of energy poverty. And if we accomplish those two objectives, accelerate bending the curve on COVID-19, in vulnerable communities now, and you know, an end energy poverty over the course of the next decade, we think the action we've taken now will have actually made a big difference in the trajectory of human opportunity and equity over time, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. Now, the the efforts that you've launched in both of these sectors have rested on the idea of catalyzing others to join in with you. I mean, you can't do this alone. You don't have the capacity to to achieve those goals alone. In three years time, what would success look like in your view? This is a billion dollars over three years yeah. with very big, very big ambitions attached on both sectors. What would, in three years time, what, what will make you feel like you've been successful? Well, the, on the health side, it's actually pretty straightforward. I mean, if we can work with partners now to accelerate the introduction of testing, of contact tracing, of uh, 
improved therapeutics in particular and, uh, and vaccines and do that with a specific focus on those communities that are left behind mm -hmm. and more vulnerable. We believe that that will, uh, that will be most effective at bending the curve overall and that that's the most immediate thing we can do to ensure that communities are not put into this crisis of a, de a lost decade of, of growth and opportunity. And so in America, what that means is uh, we have already committed uh, $100 million to expanding testing. We work with 30 cities uh, and, and actually 50, but really 10 core states, but, but soon to be 50 states uh, to, as part of a compact to help make sure they can access new testing technologies, in particular, rapid, frequent antigen and pooled tests and use those tests in a surveillance and screening mode for asymptomatic populations in particular. Uh, we think one of the big parts of the response America has just missed is asymptomatic testing. Uh, 40 to 50% of the spread is people without symptoms. And to this day, we don't have a national policy, a set of CDC protocols, a federal reimbursement structure and a technology push to make sure that we're testing every kid and sending them to school or testing every essential worker or testing everyone in a nursing home. We've made some progress in the last few months uh, working with the Department of Health and Human Services and science and industry, uh, and most notably perhaps in nursing homes, but we have a long way to go. And, Thank you. Uh, and so that's a big part of what we're trying to do on that particular issue. On that note, I mean, the I want to first of all, thank you and commend you for the op-ed that you and Har Harold Varmus put out in August when there was this controversy around a, a CDC guidance uh, downplaying the asymptomatic, the need for te aggressive testing on asymptomatic cases. That was a very impactful and, 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 and moment and big and timely moment for pushing that forward. I wanna ask uh, Sarah to come on in now on, on, and talking a bit more about the energy dimensions of this, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And thanks, Raj, for being here and for your leadership on this initiative. I think the timing is uh, is really wonderful. Uh, so a couple questions um, dealing with the perspective you have on, Steve said, tying together both the, the sort of COVID-19 dimensions and the renewable energy dimensions here. There's on the one hand, there's a clear case, right? I mean, it's we we've, we've lost, as you said, we've lost time in our energy poverty goals. We've lost progress that we were been able to make. Um, the International Energy Agency and the IMF have put out a study, you know, that basically says if we invest a trillion dollars a year now for the next three years, we can create growth uh, in developing economies, and we can make back some of this progress that we had been making on on alleviating energy poverty. Uh, um, uh, shortcomings. But on the other hand, you know, you've seen countries, you know, spend like $9 trillion just to keep their economies afloat right now. How are they going to spend that money uh, to do some of these initiatives? And, and I'm not going to ask you to answer, you know, that question necessarily, but like, why have, what, how are you going to focus your money, particularly thinking about the renewable energy dimensions? What has your experience taught you about the place where you see an opportunity to attract other people to the renewable energy sector uh, in, in, in this, in this initiative? Well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for mentioning the $9 trillion. I'm going to start there because you're, uh, you're absolutely right. If you look at what advanced economies have done to support the crisis and the recovery, and you add both fiscal and monetary action together, it amounts to uh, up to about 20% of GDP, right? So it's a massive influx of both monetary and fiscal policy capital to drive an effective recovery and response. Emerging markets, the answer is around 6%. Lesser developed countries, it's a 2%. And those are countries that then don't have uh, real monetary policy capability the way industrial ones do. So the reality is, you know, I think that uh, Larry Summers published something through the group of 30 recently that was picked up. It, it, we just need to see a much bigger recovery action spearheaded by the global institutions that have been established to support these types of efforts like the IMF, the World Bank and, and other multilateral institutions. As part of that, we think that we, the Rockefeller Foundation have been working for more than a decade 
on specific efforts to bring renewable electrification to those who are poor and left out of the modern economy. And you would say, okay, that feels like a pretty niche issue, right? But the reality is uh, we know that actually for about a billion people on earth, they simply do not benefit from being part of a modern economy and they don't have any opportunity to improve their own labor productivity because they live in communities that do not have access to sustained, reliable, productive electricity. In November, before we had to shut down our travel, I had a chance to be in Bihar, India, in several of those communities. And you'd walk through a village and you would see uh, some you know, activity going on, farm processing, a little hut where they're making, a carpenter was making product, a bunch of food stations. And it was kind of around four or five o'clock as it got dark, the lights went on and things persisted. And then the power went out because government power in that village is on for like three hours a day and then it's off. And normally everybody would, that would be the end of the economic day and girls would not be reading at night. Uh, you know, kids would be out in an unsafe, dark environment, shops all shut down and the economy is closed. What happened next stunned me, right? In the next two minutes, the Rockefeller supported renewable solar mini grid that had been installed in that area kicked in. The lights went back on, activity started. I met that carpenter. I said, hey, what do you do now that you're a customer of this small utility that's providing solar energy? What are you able to do? He's like, well, I'm able to buy power tools. I'm able to hire people, create jobs. I'm able to sell four or five times as much volume of product and move myself and my family up the chain. That's what we should have for everybody. And it's always been the case that the big, massive, dislocating crises have been when nations build infrastructure, right? It was out of, out of the Great Depression, we built so many of the big dams and big energy projects that electrified America. We have to take that opportunity to do that now, and we have to do it in a green way. And what I think we've proven through our early, ex more experimental work is we can, we can deliver energy through these renewable solutions at about 15 cents a kilowatt hour, down from maybe 80 plus cents a kilowatt hour just a few years ago, that the technology is such that it is the best solution relative to building big coal plants and connecting them by expensive and unreliable power lines. And that there's a whole host of private companies that will partner with us to do it. We launched a billion dollar joint venture with Tata Power that week in India to build 10,000 of these rural mini grids across the country. That's an extraordinary achievement. And we can replicate that throughout Africa, throughout parts of Latin America, in Puerto Rico, uh, in places where it will help transform the local economy and make growth more inclusive for those left behind. So, you know, practical solutions that work, that have data and have been assessed that are on the technology frontier. Batteries are gonna keep getting cheaper and better. Uh, uh, remote uh, artificial intelligence-based management of these systems make them more and more viable over time, not the opposite. Smart meters and cell phone-based payments make it possible that even in the most poor communities in the world, you can turn the lights on and you can start a business and you can hire people and you can grow. If the recovery from COVID-19 is defined by a major global green investment, to end energy poverty, the world will simply be much more equitable, much more inclusive, and as CSIS has documented time and time again, more safe because of that greater degree of participation. And that's what we're about. So one follow-up question before turning it back over to Steve on that. You mentioned the role of the private sector in partnerships. One of the things that we're very curious about in our own work is thinking about the capacity of developing economies to absorb investment, particularly at this period of time of economic hardship. Who are the partners that you're looking for to deploy this amount, you know, and to catalyze future, you know, further efforts in, in, in the microgrid space? Is it really Rockefeller partnering with the private sector? Is there a government role here? How do you make the most opportunity out of the dollars you'll put towards this? Well, as with any big enterprise and aspiration, it takes everybody. And so we, we've been successful in parts of India and in parts of Africa and parts of Latin America where governments have partnered with us and provided a, a modest but important capital expenditure subsidy that makes these projects a bit more viable um, at the get-go. 
we have also needed governments to create the licensing structure so that these uh, more innovative new energy companies are allowed to sell power to customers in, in these communities. What we've proven by partnering, by the way, is that customers pay them back a little bit like the creation of the microfinance industry. It might be surprising, but a very poor woman living in Northern India is gonna pay 26, 27, 28 cents a kilowatt hour, three times the price we probably pay here in DC. And, uh, and they'll pay with 98% reliability. So it, it's just extraordinary because it is lifting their family out of poverty. It's creating opportunity. It's a good deal for them. And it's only gonna become better over time. So we need governments to play a very important role. We do need the development institutions and banks to, to be a part of this. That's why they were created. This is our moment. And so we're in dialogue with uh, major institutions in that regard. The World Bank has, I think, pioneered some very similar uh, types of collaborations in, in from Nigeria to Rwanda and Myanmar. Uh, but we'll work with everybody. And ultimately, we need the private uh, private enterprises to say this is a new way of thinking about delivering electrification to the world's populate the world's productive population. This is energy to start businesses. This is energy to grow economies. This is energy to lift people up. It's not not just the important task of turning on lights in a home. It's about productive power. And uh, and I think there are dozens of of big companies and probably hundreds, if not thousands, of small entrepreneurs who want to be a part of this solution as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I'd like to come back to um, the work that Rockefeller started this year on the testing action plan here in the United States. You mentioned earlier, $100 million action. You moved fairly quickly in, in assembling a, a coalition of, of a very diversified coalition of experts from different disciplines, governors, ultimately 10 state consortium, of private sector testing firms, of citizens and providers. You filled a void, you stepped in when it looked like the national government was ab abdicating responsibility on testing. And here we are, this critical dimension, this critical tool required for us to get a handle on this pandemic missing, and you jumped in. How did this work in your view? And what did you learn in doing that? Because it moved pretty fast in this period and you, I think you deserve congratulations for this, but unpack this. How did this happen and how did it work? Well, well, thank you, Steve. Let, let me start by just saying, I think uh, first and foremost, the, you know, the playbook to get on top of a pandemic could not be more straightforward. You identify people who are, are contagious, who would otherwise spread the disease, and you figure out how to remove them from the chain of transmission. That's the whole playbook. <laughs> like, like it is so much easier than you would think if you just think about the basic math. And when I learned uh, helping to lead the Ebola response in West Africa in 2014 is, is you got to have a data-driven approach to doing that. So, you know, remember we saw in that setting that, that those Ebola cases were being spread by, uh, you know, young girls, daughters, hugging parents who had died of Ebola washing their bodies, doing uh, elaborate and important rites of passage. And, but that was a point of spread. So we created these WHO uh, teams, got all these local community groups uh, and community development groups together and went out and removed those bodies in safe body bags and, and tried to get people to stop that practice of touching um, and washing the bodies of those that are deceased. That was the single biggest thing that reduced the chain of transmission in that moment because that was 70% of case transmission. Today with uh, COVID-19 in the United States, we know what is causing transmission. About a little bit more than half of transmission is people with symptoms spreading the disease, usually not wearing masks and usually in uh, crowded uh, indoor settings. And the rest of the transmission, 40 to 50%, is people without symptoms in that same setting. And so, you know, we have we thought early on, well, you can't have a data-driven response if you don't know who amongst the group of us that does not have symptoms is likely to be spreading the disease. And we just felt that testing had to be ubiquitous across society, cheap and fast in order to get on top of that. And then we looked around the world and Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, parts of China, much of Northern Europe. I mean, places that were succeeding 
had broad ubiquitous testing. You would land in South Korea, you would get tested. You'd go to wherever you were staying, they would send you a care package so that you could take care of yourself in isolation for two weeks. They'd call you every day and they'd get you your result right away. And then, and then they'd hold on to you for two weeks and then you'd be allowed to enter society. In America, it, whether you had symptoms or not, early on, you couldn't get a test. So we, we brought together scientists, industry leaders, economists, Paul Romer uh, and I did an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal early on in that pathway and crafted a national strategy to get to 1 million tests, from 1 million tests a week to 3 million to 30 million. And the strategy uh, actually worked initially to get to the 3 million tests a week. That's where we thought we could scale up PCR testing pretty quickly. And then to get from 3 million to 30 million tests a week, we knew that we needed new technologies, antigen tests, pooled tests, uh, different kinds of lateral flow assay tests that, that allow you to do the point of care testing that don't require machines and, and laboratory uh, processes. That's been slower. We know we, we wanted to hit that 30 million target before the flu season hit. America didn't get there. But, uh, but we're collaborating with, with cities and states across the country with the federal government. We, we, have, been, uh, we have an MOU with the HHS that has procured 150 million of these BINAX now right tests and and we are today rolling them out in six cities across America in schools to demonstrate to collect data on how you can actually reopen schools using uh, more frequent rapid testing. Um, when all this happened, another piece of data came out, very, very important piece of data that showed most of the spread in America was happening in the first two days of someone um, who had gone to get a test. And what that meant after they got that test, and what that meant was the long lead times, five, six, seven days, 14 days in some cases, for someone to get a result from their test was basically invalidating the millions right. of tests that were taking place from the perspective of COVID control. So, uh, you know, what we learned, I mean, I think we've seen this, where it's worked, it's always a collaboration, public and private, it's always data-driven. And frankly, it's always paid for. And America has yet to kind of get, get to the point where they pay for it, where we pay for it for everybody. Do you think you're reaching a point of proving the concept, like you mentioned, the six cities, schools? Well, uh, I, the I do. The consortium that, that you can market this to Congress. I mean, Congress has been hung up in its spending bill, right? For yeah. the fifth I, spending I, bill. Is I it is your strategy to see demonstrate bipartisanship demonstrate cooperation across these different sectors and be able to scale because it's going to require some national endorsement at the financing side at a minimum, plus to get these 100 to 200,000, uh, 300,000 boots on the ground for contact tracing who are another important element of your vision. So do you see that moment arriving where you've, you've proven the concept and you can drive forward in your dialogue with Congress and then in the administration on this? Well, absolutely. And by the way, we've already made real progress, right? The, the, the advanced procurement, which was $750 million for the Binax Now yes. test was a huge market signal and a huge step forward. Uh, the administration has sent millions of tests to states. The problem is uh, the CDC has yet to produce protocols for how those tests should be used. Uh, there are some issues with off-label and on-label use of the test in asymptomatic populations. And, and we're still in the process, as I mentioned, around the pilots of collecting data. Right. Uh, uh, to be quite honest, I think the NBA has done as much as we have done to demonstrate this can work. And our basic thesis is that we should treat teachers in low-income communities it, that are serving kids in America like they mm -hmm. are professional athletes and give them a chance to go to work in a safe environment and educate kids and get America back on track. Um, and, and so I, I give a lot of credit actually to all of the professional sports leagues that have figured out how to use aggressive testing to be open in some construct. And there's a lot to learn from that, including by the way, the NBA and Yale have partnered with the Saliva Direct Right, um, a technology, and and we're proud to support that. University of Illinois has rolled that out across right. uh, schools in in Illinois and at the university mm -hmm. itself, and has tremendous data on the value of this approach. So yes, I think there is plenty of data now to demonstrate this is actionable and doable. Now it'll take presidential leadership to say America is going to get a more aggressive 
national strategy on COVID. We're going to do it while sending our kids to school, protecting our essential workers, and protecting those who are vulnerable in nursing homes. We're going to do it with an equity first mindset and make sure that African American communities and other vulnerable communities have preferential access, not back of the line access to the, the tools they need to survive through this crisis. And we're going to do it with determination and federal reimbursement. And I just want to uh, add that forward to know, that day when that happens. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it has been really impressive over the course of the summer into the fall, the coalition of universities and colleges formed around the Broad Institute, plus, as you mentioned, Illinois, Arizona have been phenomenal. Then you have institutions like the University of Wisconsin-Madison that really stumbled badly, but recovered and is now looking at 80,000 tests a week. Um, so there's been a, there's been an enormous amount of learning and partnerships created that on the education sector alone has driven forward innovation dramatically in this period. One question around the ACT accelerator, the, the ideas you're putting forward here on the domestic side, you've proven an enormous amount. On the international side, we have this urgent situation of the ACT accelerator around vaccines in particular, but also on, on diagnostics and therapies for low income and middle income countries that don't have the, the wherewithal to, to reserve doses, dosages of vaccines and the like. We have Gavi out front moving that forward. We have the Global Fund on the pandemic response. How does what you're doing in this initiative tie, if at all, to those, to those developments of the ACT accelerator and also the, 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 the rising demand for US leadership and engagement in the ACT accelerator? Well, I think if there's one thing we learned from prior efforts to both uh, respond to existing pandemics and prevent future ones, it's that U.S. leadership is indispensable to driving a successful global and coordinated effort. And so the Rockefeller effort has been global and coordinated from day one. And, and we are supporting the ACT A effort um, that you mentioned. We're supporting efforts to help countries uh, come up with uh, equity oriented vaccination programs. We are very highly invested in getting testing strategies to work across the globe. Um, in India, we, in addition to working with the government to set national targets, we're, we're investing in research facilities and industry to create uh, rapid PCR testing that can be executed at a high, uh, with a high degree of effectiveness and cost effectiveness. In Africa, we are buying distributing antigen tests that we think are a big, big part of the solution and, and missing to date in, in the African response. And in both of those settings and in Latin America, our focus has been making sure that essential services for health are not completely decimated by the urgent need to uh, focus on COVID-19. Uh, and, and that's been really tough, as you would imagine. I think the goalkeepers report highlighted the consequence of diverting community health resources away from malaria control. From right in child health. And uh, this, this could be, if done well, this could be a moment of increased investment in all of primary care around the world. Um, or it could be making a big trade-off that will lead to, you know, uh, right. lost decades of progress on, on basic human health indicators and survival indicators. Thank you. I want to turn to Sarah to get us off on a discussion around foundations. Yeah, thanks, Raj, um, and thanks, Steve. I, so, you know, I don't know, Raj, if you saw it, there's a cartoon of a guy standing on a beach and there's like a tidal wave and it's called COVID. And then there's a bigger tidal wave behind it and it's called climate change. And it, it really, it, it's a striking visual. It encapsulates a lot of how in our own work, uh, thinking about climate change, we're looking at this COVID-19 experience going, wow, like there's a lot of capacity that is needed to deal with both these, you know, quick turnaround sort of crises and then these long burning ones like climate. And one of the things that we've observed is just the role of philanthropy, um, particularly in this crisis to stand up just much bigger efforts, really like to think about, to really sort of lead the charge and thinking big about big solutions. Is there, is there a, you, you mentioned that there's a moment here, right? And, and there is a moment relative to this challenge. I think forward to future challenges, you know, like climate change, current and future challenges like climate change that are just going to require, it's not like just investing in, you know, um, uh, in infrastructure, like we have in past crises period. It's 
bigger than that. It's enormous. And I'm just curious, like, what is the dialogue like between you and other philanthropies thinking about having to marshal efforts like that, that are multidimensional, that have these bigger pieces? How, how are you thinking about rising to that, to that moment? And, and, and what has it meant for you in, in, this, um, in this initiative? Well, I, I think you're right that this is a moment that requires doing things differently. You know, the Rockefeller Foundation is 107 years old, and I've had a, a, a joking reference about that history, which is every time we come up with an idea we're really proud of, someone who is more acquainted with the details of our background will say, oh, we did that in 1932, and here's what we learned. <laughs> you know, and, and it feels like we rarely do anything that's truly new and innovative. This is the first time in 107 years we have gone to the debt markets and raised this kind of capital and said, we're going to go all in. And, uh, and that feels appropriate to me. It is risky. It, it is uh, definitely you know, not standard practice. Uh, a number of other foundations have uh, pursued similar financing actions. Uh, I do think when we get together as, as philanthropies, I try to make the case that we should collectively be bolder and that frankly, we should collectively work more uh, with more intention around building the kind of public private partnerships and institutions that can stand the test of time. I'm very proud of both Rockefeller and the Gates Foundation that gave rise to the, the uh, children's vaccine program, which then became Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. I think, Stephen, your point, we would not be in a place where we could imagine rolling out the COVID-19 vaccines in developing countries had we not had almost two decades of building that system. Um, and, and philanthropies can take a risk and do things first. But at the end of the day, it takes others and especially the public sector to come in and make them um, big enough to matter and, um, and, and sustainable over the very long run. So, you know, right now, as part of our big bet here, we're going to try to build a pandemic action platform that would allow anyone anywhere to visualize primary source data on the 200 plus outbreaks that take place every year so that we're not uh, questioning government leaders in the future as to whether they have a pandemic on their hands. That never works. I've tried it a number of times personally. And, and for what you can, you can study the reasons why, but, but no head of state likes to be the first one to say, uh, we have a pandemic on our hands, everyone stay away. And, uh, and that could be a, a disrupted system uh, with some new technology and a major global pandemic action platform. We're trying to build a smart power global collaboration that would be effectively the Gavi for distributed renewable energy around the world. And we know from Gavi that it takes two decades, you know, to build something that can, uh, you can look back and say, okay, we, we vaccinated 800 million kids. Like that takes a long time, but we can, we can stand tough for a long time and we can go big initially over time. We will need others, uh, governments in particular to, to be big, and central partners if it's gonna be the kind of institution that actually changes the world for the better and changes the nature of human equity and opportunity in uh, developing countries in particular. So I, I think the lesson is uh, go big, go big now and do it with a absolute determination to hold hands with others who can bring scale and sustainability to these efforts and then, and then hope that two decades from now, someone looks back and says, Gosh, that worked. Raj, just one follow-up question to that, which in, in weaving in something that we got a question from the audience, which I think a lot about and exists a lot in climate change conversations, which is um, thinking about co-benefits or dealing with two problems at once, those types of things. And, and this initiative feels a lot like that, right? You're thinking about both COVID response and, and renewable energy. There was a question here too about like the, the food inequities and the, in, the fragilities in our food system. When you think about making investments in renewable energy, there's been a lot sustainable energy for all has done some work on this uh, around this idea of do you do you prioritize investments that are really just solving an energy poverty problem or or ones that actually catalyze some other thing right it's like helping with vaccine distribution or it's helping rebolster the food security system like it's kind of a procedural question but how do you think about coupling those issues together when you think about how you spend the money that you're you're putting towards these problems well, you know, as you know, they are all extraordinarily linked. So for example, uh, much of our work on addressing energy poverty 
is in rural communities around the world that are largely still agrarian economies. And so when we say uh, demand creation for energy consumption, what we're talking about is irrigation or post harvest processing on farm or helping people transport crops from farms to markets. I mean, that's what it actually looks and feels like when you're on the ground in a village um, in a community that has been hit by COVID, that has been excluded from major fiscal and monetary stimulus and, res and recovery resources, and where people feel, uh, where people are hungry and suffering and are effectively left behind in a global recovery. And so, you know, it, it's all one and the same. Uh, there, there's no real difference between uh, when, when you're focused on building inclusive growth, you're focused on helping those communities alleviate their top constraints to growth. Um, in our case, the technology that we think is unique and transformational is energy technology. And so we see that as the way to help many of those uh, farm families improve their livelihoods and move their families out of poverty. Thank you. Steve? Thanks. Raj, um, what's, what's keeping you awake uh, when you think about this at night as, as you're thinking about this, this grand initiative, this very ambitious initiative that you're putting forward? What, what, were, what do you worry about? Well, I'd say the, the biggest thing I worry about is whether, uh, you know, those tidal waves that Sarah was just describing. Um, mm -hmm. I worry that we can really get enough collaborators around the table so that the force of action is big enough to matter. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just, that's really, that's really what I worry about. And so, for example, uh, I don't think of it as just launching a mini grid program for renew for rural electrification. I think we, we are trying to work with institutional partners to have a significant global green recovery and make sure that the institutions that support lesser developed nations have the ability to drive significant capital into a global green recovery, of which a small part of that would be to help address uh, energy needs and build energy infrastructure in a modern and climate friendly way. So kind of in er everything we do is ideally in a partnership construct with institutions, nations, and platforms that have much more capacity than uh, any philanthropy would. And in this case, I think, you know, if President Biden is elected, uh, Vice President Biden is elected, then I, I would expect uh, some early G20 kind of coordination around a global recovery, mm -hmm. like President Obama did with the L'Aquila uh, summit uh, when he took office, Recognized, and we recognized then that the global financial crisis had extraordinary impacts on food security and poverty uh, and launched an effort that later in America became Feed the Future, but in other countries took other forms. Similarly, I, I very much hope that there will be thought given to what the international economic recovery is going to be in lower, um, in countries that have lower average incomes um, than the G20 nations. And that ought to be a part of a renewed commitment to coordinated global action. And these last few years, by the way, where there's been very little coordinated global action um, has exacerbated this crisis and kind of called for the kind of action Rockefeller is taking right now. Well, if things do move in that direction where there's a will at a high level to come together and think strategically about what a recovery is going to look like and to factor in this dimension around energy poverty, Clearly, you would want the United States to be coming in. I mean, be, in your tenure, Power Africa was launched. It's not scaled. It could be scaled in a much different way. The EU is going to play a role. I'm assuming the Chinese are going to play a role in this, too. And maybe you could say a bit, a bit about how do, you, how do you reach out and incorporate others that have not been at the table very in a very dramatic way as donors, as part of a broader unity of effort. What we've seen in this last year has been somewhat shocking in terms of the paralysis of the Security Council, paralysis of the G7, G20. Um, the US sinking into a very bitter, toxic confrontation with China, which crowds out all sorts of other things. So how do we move forward in this 
period of a, of a, of a, of a different recovery? And how do we get those most powerful countries in the mix? What's your view on that? Well, my view is you do that by engagement. And, and in China, we used to have a strategic and economic dialogue that enabled us to tackle some really tough issues uh, where there was a very acrimonious relationship and simultaneously cooperate on a range of uh, scientific and humanitarian and other collaborations that were in the interest of uh, both countries and, and the world overall. And we have to kind of implement that mindset. So, you know, I'm not exceedingly hopeful about the, the G20 that's coming up in just a few uh, days, but I do think that uh, a, a renewed call to coordinate a global action uh, is, you know, crisis has always been an opportunity and we cannot waste this opportunity. We, we are going to spend trillions of dollars at home and around the world in the spirit of recovery. We can either do it to build back societies that have become so inequitable and so acrimonious uh, that it takes a week to find out who won the American presidential election or we can do it in a manner that lifts up those who feel left behind, uses new technology and private capital, is green and protective for our climate, and above all else, allows a couple billion people to feel vested and included in the future. That's the choice. And you know, strong leadership, global coordination, a vision of what's possible with technology and partnership, and a determination to not let this crisis be wasted will allow us to get there. Rockefeller is making a billion dollar commitment because we think the time is now to inspire that type of leadership. And we wanna work with anyone who's able to, you know, uh, see that possibility and, and make an effort at reshaping the world for the better. Thank you, Raj. I'm gonna ask you in a moment to share with us what, you, what gives you the greatest op optimism and strength in this really difficult period. But before you answer that closing question here, I wanna come back to Sarah and ask her for any closing thoughts or, or remarks. No, I was just gonna say, I do think um, it, it is a, it's an important time, uh, something you wrote and uh, in your announcement of this, which I think shouldn't go wasted in thinking about the renewable energy opportunity is that we've actually hit a tremendous pivot point where your dollars can be spent extremely well because the technology has reached a level of maturity and governments have reached a level of familiarity where it's, it's not the same challenge it would have been five years ago. And I think your work has contributed to that, but it's, it's actually quite exciting to see the technology readiness. Sorry if I want to walk out for a bit, but like the technology readiness is as at a point where it could really take off. And that, I think that's that ingredient that also gives me hope to see, you know, when strategy meets the technology that's ready, I think uh, big things can happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I agree. So Raj, why don't you close you here? That? Give give us your last give us your last thoughts about where you where you find the greatest hope and optimism. You, you know, I I, um, I just think I, I guess it maybe all those experiences at USAID being um, exposed to moments that look so dark and so tough. The Haiti earthquake uh, when it transpired, I'd visit. Eastern Congo uh, and, and meet with kids who came out of Northern Uganda and elsewhere who had been through hell and back and, you know, Afghanistan with active conflict. And I do feel like after all of these extraordinarily turbulent and deeply depressing crises, uh, people just have a mindset around rebuilding and growth that is, uh, that's different. You know, you've kind of been beaten down and uh, you know, in some cases, left for dead, and and you decide you're going to approach the future with a greater sense of purpose, and we'll see what happens in the U.S. election. But I'm pretty confident that enough Americans will uh, support a vision of the future that has that greater purpose. And so I I think uh, all these things go in cycles. I remember. Uh, being part of pulling together the sustainable development goals and feeling like that was going to be such a strong signal about where we could go together. Uh, and I saw so much positivity around that. And then we lost a lot of progress against those goals. I think we're about to hit a 
inflection point where, where people are back uh, on a more hopeful and more cooperative trajectory. I think it is going to be forced by the reality that we need a extraordinarily strong and courageous recovery uh, to what is a unique once in a generation uh, crisis, once in a lifetime crisis. And, uh, and I think it's aided by the fact that the technology, as Sarah put it, exists to rebuild in a manner that is so much more inclusive and protective and frankly just makes more sense. It creates more jobs, it's cheaper, it's more highly leveraged because of private investment. You know, uh, Mo Ibrahim used to tell me that he built some of the early parts of the African uh, mobile phone system in Kinshasa during a wartime. And, you know, I, I just think this is, Bill Gates used to say that he built, micro, he started Microsoft in a recession, you know, that seemed endless. I just feel like this is our moment for uh, being creative, for being collaborative and for aiming so much higher so that this type of crisis never happens again. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been really rich. It's been inspiring. I think to, to in this dark moment, dark and really difficult and uncertain moment, to be able to see what you're doing um, and and the, the the contribution that all the staff there at Rockefeller are making towards this leadership and this vision and the risks that you've been taking. I mean, it, you've put yourself out on a limb in a couple of big ways, which you know is very commendable and this this is a time that requires us to stretch ourselves to bend ourselves to take risks so thanks to you thanks for your leadership and your service to our country and uh and we wish you all the best with this and i'm sure we'll have this conversation further down the road as things evolve sarah any closing thoughts no just thanks thanks very much for joining us today thank you thanks steve thanks sarah and thanks to the whole csis team Keep at it.